Hello, my name is Paul St. John. I'm the founder of a therapy called Neurosomatic Therapy. And it is generally takes a holistic view of the body. Today's subject, we're going to talk about the temporomandibular joint. And you may think that this is only the province of dentistry. So this mandible fits into this temporal bone. This is the temporal mandibular joint. And there's a disc there that prevents too much pressure from the jaw going into the temporal bone. But it's much more complicated than that. And something you may not know that causes a lot of distress in the temporal mandibular joint is a condition called leg length inequity, where one leg is physically shorter than the other. Now we have two 3,000 person studies that have established planet-wide that about 50% of the people are walking around with a leg length difference. And once it gets above four millimeters, there this pressure from just common gait pattern, it's like a mini whiplash, 10 to 15,000 times a day. And that goes up into the head, up the postural chain, and influences the muscles that have the biggest influence on the TMJ. Now, when we're talking about temptor, temporal mandibular joint problems, generally, this condyle of the mandible has been forced with great force into the temporal bone, moving it superiorly and posteriorly. So if we look at the muscles involved, we look at the temporalis, big large muscle here that attaches to this point on the mandible, and it's a clinching muscle. And there's another one on the inside called the masseter. Then there's another muscle that can bring posterior pressure, and it's called the digastric. Then there's another clenching muscle on the inside called the medial pterygoid. So the muscles that are most important to treat to get rid of the pressure in the temporal mandibular joint are the medial and lateral pterygoids, the digastric, the temporalis. All these muscles create pressure. But then there's the structural component. That is, if you have a leg length inequity, you're experiencing this mini whiplash that works its way up into the head. And we found the worst cases of temporal mandibular joint that we have seen, generally the person has between a seven and 12 millimeter leg length difference, which is causing a scoliosis that they don't even know they have because the pelvis tilts to the short leg side. Then there's another force that works its way up and that's if the pelvis flexes or goes into antiversion. Because there's a muscle that goes the whole length of the spine all the way from the coccyx all the way to this mastoid process. And that's called the erector spinae. So if you have too much flexion in the pelvis, that erector spinae tightens and produces a pulling on the temporal bone, which creates more interjoint pressure. So from a structural standpoint, a dentist will use a bite splint to relieve that pressure. And the purpose of that splint is to bring the jaw forward and down uh, to create less pressure. Then we've talked about these muscles that create pressure above. And I don't imagine there are many dentists who've ever even thought about leg length inequity as a contributing factor to temporal mandibular joint dysfunction. But it is incredibly important because of this pull of tonus of the erector spinae. And then you see people with forward head postures. So muscles like the sternocleidomastoid, right? Um, uh, become another function that we need to look at. It's not as simple as making uh, mandibular teeth meet maxillary teeth. It just isn't that simple. And someday, dentists will be more integrated and in looking at the structural component. And I hope this 
uh, add some clarity to why it's important to not just look at making mandibular teeth meet maxillary teeth. That the function of the muscles is to move bones. I mean, the bones in that finger are moving because muscles move them. So muscles play a key role. Posture plays a role. And leg length and equity. The fact of having one leg shorter than the other. That is a big missing component in things like scoliosis. It's a big missing component in dentistry because most dentists have never looked at the structural component, the whole structural component related to temporomandibular joint dysfunction. So I hope this video lends clarity to the importance of expanding the dental paradigm in order to view the whole body because temporomandibular joint dysfunction is not the province of just the single joint. Um, and attempts to use artificial discs like proclast discs uh, have been horrible. Uh, they don't work very well uh, producing synthetic discs. Another component to look at is the symmetry or asymmetry of the cranium itself. Like if a dentist would just put their fingers into the auditory canal, what they will see with a lot of people, the one side is high and one side is low. When they look like this, they'll see one side is anterior, one side is posterior. This creates a lot of grinding patterns in the teeth. So blows to the head itself can be a um, component of temporomandibular joint dysfunction. And um, we have programs designed to teach anyone, but teach dentists how to evaluate the cranium from a superior to inferior degree and an anterior to posterior degree. All these are important in stabilizing this incredibly important joint in dentistry. So I hope this has added some clarity to how we would evaluate and what needs to be evaluated in looking at a holistic body view of this condition called temporomandibular joint dysfunction.